lot of times when we think about supply chains, we understandably think about some form of material, be it a finished product or an asset we're moving around or whatever it may be. The reality is the military moves around enormous amounts of people all the time. It's got to be maybe the largest resource planning organization on the planet. Uh, and, and that's just a supply chain, a supply chain of people. So how do you do that? And how do you figure out how to do that effectively and efficiency, efficiently such that, you know, where you need those resources at a particular point in time, standard supply chain solve, right, problem to solve, uh, you can do it. Uh, and, and for our military uh, on a global basis. Hello, my name is Robert Schmidt. I'm Deloitte's Chief Futurist, also known as Mr. IoT. Today on my coffee chat, I have, actually I have my boss, uh, Adam Musamelli, who leads our supply chain and network operations practice. So I, I better do a good job today. No, welcome Adam, it's great to have you. We've talked about having you on the show for a few times. I'm actually super excited to uh, be here with you. How are you doing? How is the family doing? Everybody healthy and good? I'm doing great, Robert, and so good to see you again, and uh, thanks for having me. I know we've worked through some scheduling challenges, so it's, it's great to be here. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a wild time with scheduling, I find, you know? In some ways, I have a lot more time, and somehow it's all filled up. I don't know. How are you doing with scheduling? Is it sort of like even wilder for you? Uh, well, I think, I think we're probably uh, sharing the same world on this. Um, you know, I find that there is no shortage of things to do. And uh, in today's world, where we're staying at home, right, I don't, I don't have buffers anymore between meetings, right? So I, I don't have to schedule in things like, hey, I, I actually got to go get food to eat, or I want to refill my coffee or something like that. It's just one thing after the other. I have once in a while, I text my wife, uh, which she's next door, right? And I text her and say, would you mind bringing me something to eat so I don't get hangry? And then she texts me back, can I come in now? Am I on video? So we have these conversations, it's pretty funny. Yeah. Adam, yeah. you've been with Deloitte for a long, long time. Uh, you've been with us 23 years, is that correct? Yeah, since, uh, since 97, it's been a while. So give us a little bit about your journey. Um, I'd love to. I mean, I know part of it, but I'd love to hear about it. I know how people like to hear. What's a 23-year-long journey like at Deloitte? Uh, well, it's it's been a great journey, obviously, or, or I wouldn't be here. But but it's it's kind of an unintentional journey. Um, I, I like to call myself the, the accidental consultant. Um, I, I didn't grow up with anybody that was a consultant anywhere, a friend of the family or anything like that. I uh, started my career really in the military. and. Um, and, you know, in business school, I heard about things like consulting, but I didn't pay too much attention to it. I actually uh, went into industry and worked there for a number of years uh, doing supply chain and operational jobs. And then friends of mine that had joined Deloitte just uh, sought me out, said, hey, listen, you know, there's a lot of interesting work here. We think you'd like it. We think you'd be good at it. And, you know, 23 years ago, I was single. So I thought, why not? You know, I'll, I'll do it. It was the classic, you know, going into consulting plan. I'll, I'll do it for two years, right? And we'll see what happens. And two years that were great, turned into three, turned into four. And I liked the work I was doing. And maybe I was a little bit fortunate because I knew I had done supply chain and operations work before I joined the firm. I knew that's what I wanted to do. Now I was doing it in a consulting setting. So um, that, that probably helped. But um, just just love the work, love the clients, love the people, and uh, ultimately this is this is the career now, right? Yeah, this is how I came to the U.S. I'm gonna be here for two years and then I go back. Uh, yeah. I ended up going back for a year to Austria ten years later, and people asked me, "What are you doing here?" So <laughs> it was kind of funny. Um, so Adam, supply chain network operations. It's such a topic right now with, um, you know, what does supply chain mean? What's going on? Tell us a little bit how we experienced this and not so much from a, what's the business like, but sort of topical. What's coming up now? What's changed the last couple of months and uh, how we think, how you think about supply chain? Yeah. So, you know, it's um, on, on one hand, you know, when I think about the world of supply chain, um, it's, it's very simple. 
right? At, at the end of the day, in any supply chain, you uh, plan the movement and conversion of materials, right? And then, and then you do it. Whether you're in a make to stock or make to order supply chain, there's always some element to that, figuring out exactly where the planning stops and the execution begins. And that's been forever true, right? Um, what's, what's super interesting is how we do that and the capabilities by which we do that have been changing uh, fairly dramatically, certainly over the past 10 years, increasingly so over the past five. And now, um, as we look at the issues our clients are facing in pretty much any sector, increasingly so, right? So if we look at uh, just planning itself, and let's say understanding something like demand for some good or service, right? If we were having this discussion three years ago, we'd probably be thinking more along the lines of traditional demand planning, which would look at several years worth of history, maybe run it through an algorithm or two if we're really fancy. Maybe we had three or four different algorithms to look at, project forward a curve, and from there do some sort of blowout into skews and figure out how to start to move the materials based on, based on that demand. But, you know, as we move forward to today, I think increasingly, you know, your world of IoT is much more important. So what can we find out about what's happening right now and what just happened and how does that influence demand and get us into more of a demand sensing world? So that's, that's a major turn. And then I think the other thing that's pretty safe to say, at least over the foreseeable year or two, the past two years aren't going to be really good at predicting what's happening over the next two years, right? The, the world has changed a lot. So this notion of just looking at, you know, two or three years of history and projecting it forward and working from, from that uh, starting point, probably not the way to go, right? So things are changing pretty rapidly. I, you mentioned you went military and I, I got to put a plug in there. I did a little research and I looked at your Facebook page and there was, if anybody ever wants to see super young uh, Adam, you have a profile picture in your military uniform, which was great to see. Um, I was curious, um, I find the military is one of those that has a very complicated supply chain. Um, and I've also found that working with people that come out of the military, there's so much value that cross correlates between them. I remember uh, we hire people from there and uh, I remember Activision hire people from there actively. What did you bring from there? Was there anything in particular that you can think of, think back about that? Um, yeah, th there were a couple things. I mean, several things, uh, quite frankly, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll share two that um, I found particularly important as models to think about uh, as we think about effectiveness and efficiency in any supply chain uh, setting. One is just uh, the way uh, either our own military or any military thinks about organization and how it gets things done and the flow of information through it and the different operating models and network models that either enable or inhibit that, right? And how you think about, well, you know, what should really be done, call it more at the center versus in a dispersed sort of uh, nature and, you know, what sort of decision-making is local versus what sort of decision-making is, is not. Uh, so that's, that's always been a really important uh, piece of what I've taken out of the military in terms of applicability to supply chain. The other piece is the whole notion of resource planning, right? You, you mentioned, the big supply chains the military has. And a lot of times when we think about supply chains, we understandably think about some form of material, be it a finished product or an asset we're moving around or whatever it may be. The reality is the military moves around enormous amounts of people all the time. It's gotta be maybe the largest resource planning organization on the planet. Uh, and, and that's just a supply chain, a supply chain of people. So how do you do that? And how do you figure out how to do that effectively and efficiency, efficiently such that, you know, where you need those resources at a particular point in time, standard supply chain solve, right, problem to solve, uh, you can do it. Uh, and, and for our military uh, on a global basis. One of the things then, one of the terms you coined uh, was uh, digital supply networks and sort of like how it's not really a chain anymore, but it's a network. 
And, um, you know, I, I love how census help us map out that network, help us optimize that network. Talk a little bit about what that mind shift meant for you when you thought of this, where did it came from and where do you see it? And just talk a little bit about it because I think it's such an important aspect of where we're going with this. Yeah, you know, I think um, when I think about digital supply networks and, you know, the underlying premise of really what that means, to your point, what that means is understanding enough about what's needed as an outcome from that network. So customer service level, whatever it is, uh, as, and the, the need to understand in order to meet that outcome, what's happening labor, material-wise, resource-wise across that entire network and the decisions being made. Um, that, that's the fundamental premise is being able to do that on a network basis. That's what DSN is all about. And, and, and the, way, the way we got there, uh, to the point of your question was, uh, we kept thinking about looking at history and our collective experience across our team, right? And what we do and, and our clients' experiences, how inevitably there was always one more piece of information beyond where we sat in a supply chain that was helpful to us in making a decision, right? So if I was in a manufacturing plant um, and we wanted to go ahead and we're trying to run production to meet a customer request, well, it was helpful to understand what was happening in another manufacturing plant. And it was helpful to understand what were inventory positions at different points of the network, being either inbound raw materials or outbound finished goods and understanding where they were staged and figuring out what that meant to expedite. And so the more we talked it through as we were thinking about how better, relatively better supply chain decisions were made, the more we came to the realization that, you know, this wasn't, this wasn't a node solve if we wanted to dynamically optimize. It wasn't even a chain solve. It really was this network solve. And ultimately, you know, because the technology started to allow for that a couple of years ago, largely what we call digital technology, um, it became digital supply networks. So I, I, I wouldn't be true to my title and my passion, which is thinking about the future, what's coming. Um, I just had a conversation today with uh, our team that's doing tech trends. And so they asked me about where's this going? And, you know, I talked about there's this concept of batteryless computers, right? Yeah. Uh, what does it take to stick a computer on every single piece of moving product? And sort of like think about how, what, what could that mean for me as a consumer, even not just like in the supply chain, which is a part of it, but uh, sort of like the consumer side of things, you know, all the way from the product being made to here, if I know where it is all the time, what temperature it's at, how it's being handled and so forth. So that gets me super sort of like pumped up and, you know, I can get very geeky on this. Uh, what are the things that you are looking forward to? What are sort of like some of the things, and it might not be technology, it might be processes, it might be, uh, people changes that you're looking forward to in the future or what are you missing or something like that? Well, I, I'm thinking a lot about two things. Um, one is the technical changes that, that you very accurately mentioned here, um, right? And how those um, perhaps change the point at which decisions can be made as well as how the decision is being made. Is it the person? Is it now a machine? Is it a person plus a machine make a decision, making a decision? So that's, that's one aspect I'm looking quite hard at. And then two, what that means for the definition of supply chain, right? Uh, classically, for somebody like me that grew up in supply chain, supply chain kind of started when your supplier shifted materials. If you were thinking maybe more broadly, you'd go back and you'd include a couple of tiers of suppliers in your supply chain and kind of ended when you ship the material to your customer. Um, that's not really the case anymore, right? We've, we've already kind of had a dialogue around the whole network play here beyond just the chain. But also, if these products continue to, I'll use the term, be alive in some way, shape, or form. And I love that term. You use and storage and experience 
and you can loop that back into your own supply chain and better understand, well, how do you serve that market and what capabilities do you need and what does that mean for how you think about procurement, how you think about planning and how you think about manufacturing, et cetera, uh, the definition of what supply chain is changes fairly significantly, uh, inclusive of who's even, who's even managing the supply chain moving forward, right? Uh, you have to move to the side, PII and other, other concerns like that, right? But just uh, you know, conceptually thinking about what a supply chain is as technology continues to push forward the boundaries of the time and place and type of decision we can make is of great interest to me. What I find fascinating about this is that if you think of your product just going to a warehouse, a retailer, a, a distributor, you know, the customer changes, right? At first you sell it to them. Now you're actually really connecting with the end customer. And, you know, me as an end customer, what I know is I have expectations now with connected products. And so that's a whole new world to live in. And it's an exciting world to live in. So I, I want to shift to sort of like uh, two personal questions that I have for you. One, how has technology impacted you personally? I, you know, I, and this, what comes with that is I always like to know how, enabled technically iot wise how connected is your home what do your kids run that you know or vice versa i'm just curious yeah so it's uh it's actually affected us pretty dramatically um in, in a couple different ways uh first of all um it's allowed us to become closer as a family so simple just a simple straightforward example uh before we were able to enjoy tablet computing, you know, because we've always done some amount of shopping online and the kids were researching stuff for school, et cetera, we would often find that we were in different rooms, right? So somebody would be using the office computer, somebody might be using something in the kitchen, but we were a little bit separated. And because of the, the, the whole mobile revolution that's happened, I'll just sit in the living room, right? So we find that we can do a bunch of these different things, perhaps separate activities at different points in time, but together, right? And so that's, that's been an interesting finding. The other thing is um, just watching my kids grow and they're, they're 17 and 15 now. So they, they really grew up through this way. It's, it's been fascinating to me to observe how this is just, Part of their lives and and sometimes we use the term digital native or we use that phrase I, I think it's more than that right it's it's so a part of how they think about and interact with the world that to them it's no longer work or even play it's just living right so i i have one of my sons is really into technology and you know, he's doing a bunch of different programming and stuff, but, you know, when I did it or I saw other kids in the family that came along before my, my son do it, it became a little bit of a task and something that they would allocate time to. Um, so my son, it's just like bouncing a ball on the ground. You know, of course he would do this because it's part of, you know, the world and he wants to do something that he views as cool and, just like bouncing a ball on the ground or off a wall like I did when I was a kid. He's programming because that gets him to whatever the outcome is he wants to enjoy at that particular point in time. So interesting symbiosis there. So Adam, any closing thoughts, any sort of things you want to send us off with? I appreciate the time. What, what shall well, we look out for? Well, you know, what, what, what I think about a lot today is there's significant change. Uh, across multiple, multiple dimensions right now where we sit. Certainly the pandemic is gener generating a bunch of change, which just adds to, I think, the ongoing technical change. Earlier you talked about, uh, you know, battery-less uh, computing systems. So different forms of energy, there's a lot out there. And I think that, you know, what we've experienced is people can look at that and it's so different and it's happening so fast that it can cause concern. And certainly we have to be thoughtful about what we do moving forward. Uh, it's always good to make prudent decisions with as much information as you have, but 
I think if you look at the history, especially the recent history, we find that the, the era we're moving into is generating more good, more wealth, more prosperity, better standards for everybody across most dimensions than not. And so, you know, what I think is be excited. You know, the world my kids are going to live in is probably better than the world that, you know, we've been living in and, you know, on and on and on. So I, uh, I look forward to the future with, with quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of excitement versus anxi anxiety. Adam, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me as your chief futurist. And with that, I want to say thank you for watching another episode of Coffee with Mr. IoT. And uh, if you missed any of today's show, any past shows, check out the YouTube playlist or our podcasts. Yes, we are podcast now too. And with that, I'm going to say have a great day and please stay healthy. Bye. Mm -hmm.